Blunt. Too slow. Okay, we can go. Go to Bookers Hook then, at least to watch, see if we can find the mating in the pond. Yeah, it's a good idea. Though. We'll try. Uh, yeah. Except Brent's probably already there. Brent, come in, Brent. I don't think this thing works. Brent, come in, Brent. Right, we're back. Andrew, as you were uh, witnessed there, was just cleaning the lens. Uh, what a delightful sight that must have been for all of you. Um, our plan remains the same. We're going to head across to the Bivelshoek Dam, see what we can see there. Like I say, quite a warm day, and so maybe something's been drinking. Uh, Brent is unfortunately uh, flashing in and out of signal. He's on his way to Arethusa to see if he can't find a follow-up on where Shadow was apparently mating with Tungana. Now Tungana, for those of you who haven't been watching regularly or perhaps new to us, uh, is a nine-year-old male leopard and he has been mating with 18-year-old Karula, Shadow's mother, until about well, three or four days ago and he's now moved on to the daughter. Uh, he's a busy man, of course, and possibly uh, getting a little bit exhausted. He certainly, by the time that Karula left him alone, uh, he was totally disinterested, and he certainly began in a totally disinterested fashion. So, any luck. We will have two sets of cubs within the next three months. Now that would be very special indeed. So this vehicle is very quiet. We've got some very marvellous bird calls at the moment. I can just hear calling off to the south there. That's not the south at all, it's the northwest, northeast. Uh, a red chested cuckoo. And they are one of my favourite summer birds. They call along in the thick drainage lines, in the thick vegetation of the drainage lines, and they say, Bit my fro, bit my fro. Lovely summer song. Not so lovely when you uh, understand their biology. They're uh, what we call a brood parasite, as are all cuckoos, of course. And I think they parasitize, if I'm not mistaken, the drongos. So I will check that up a little bit later. Now what that means is that they lay their eggs, no, in fact, it's mainly robins. They lay their eggs in another bird's nest. And when they're either the adults will exclude the host's nests, or when the youngsters are born, they'll either exclude the host's nests or peck the youngsters, the host's chicks to death. Uh, so that's not a particularly their behavior. It of course plays absolutely no part in the raising of the chicks. Now that is amazing. So nobody teaches a cuckoo, a young cuckoo, where to lay its eggs, what species of bird to lay its eggs with, or how to do it. It's a bit like migration, which is, a, is not a learned behavior in most birds, it's an entirely instinctual one. So that red-chested cuckoo is born. It's born into a nest of robins, say. It's fed by a robin adult all it, until it's an adult. Then it migrates away. Nobody shows it where to go. It goes and lands in northern Africa or in Europe, depending on the cuckoo. And then it comes back here in the next season and it knows somehow to lay its eggs in, a, in the host's nest and the same process unfolds. It's quite astonishing. There are some buffalo. Let's go and have a quick look at them and then we'll make our way to Bookers Hook. find a little bit of shade for us to stop in. Otherwise Andrew will complain bitterly. Um, 
bit of shade there, Andrew. Okay, there we go. So we've got some buffalo here. Some of them are swimming, of course. And for those of you who don't know, we've got cameras positioned around the place. Uh, one at this dam and one at the Arethusa Dam, which is to the west of us. And Donna, you say that you saw elephants on that camera at Arethusa at 2 o'clock. And Oki, you make the interesting observation that you think that elephants don't drink as often at Arethusa Dam as they do at other waterholes, and could that be because of the hippo? Um, you've heard that they, that hippo create a sort of film on the water that elephants perhaps don't like. I think you're, you're pretty much on the money there, Oki. Uh, I think elephants, while not necessarily wanting to avoid hippo, absolutely will try and drink at cleaner water water sources than the Arethusa Dam and I've been to that Arethusa Dam many times um, and it's it's not in a poor state at all but it is dirty water the hippo do live there they go to the loo in the water constantly there's a lot of water hyacinth in the water which probably dirties it and muddies it a bit there'll be a lot of catfish in there um, going to the loo as well on a regular basis and if elephants can avoid drinking dirty water then they will now those elephants of course can come to this water hole which is freshly pumped every day and so they can drink this kind of water and I think you'll find there are one or two pumped pans closer to Arethusa Dam that have slightly cleaner water than the Arethusa Dam does. Good point, thank you for that. And also, it was a cu curious one, you also were observing the elephants at Arethusa at about 2 o'clock this afternoon. So these buffalo are having a marvellous time swimming in the water, some of them. The rest of them lying in the shade and the others just looking pretty depressed about things. Buffalo do have a kind of look of depression on their faces. Sometimes they look at you as though you owe them money and other times they just look very depressed. That chap of course has lost half of his horns. That's because he's old. He probably lost it fighting many years ago. And of course the horns, completely unlike deer's antlers, will not grow back. They are part of the skull. It's rather like if you have a finger chopped off. Um, unless you've got some reptilian blood in you, that finger will not grow back. And as you can see, that one there has got a cataract. It looks like in his eye. Let me just retrieve my powerful binoculars. And there seem to be um, mountains of different equipment in my box there of mine. Yes, he does seem to have some kind of a cataract and he's probably blind in that left eye. Perhaps it may be milky like that because it was injured. Perhaps in a fight. Perhaps he ran through a thorn bush. It's unlikely it was done by a predator because predators would normally attack from behind. You do not want to get onto the business end of a buffalo bull if you happen to be a predator. Those horns, they're very, very strong and those horns will make short work of a, of a less than, say, considered attack from a lion. He's also lost his horn. These chaps are really very old fellows. And in case you haven't been watching for the last little while, about 14 buffalo have been killed around here between Simbambili, Arethusa, uh, Buffles Hook and Juma. And D, you make the point that indeed buffalo seem to be hot on the menu at the moment. Yes, they do. And we think probably that is because they are moving very predictably. So they're moving in and out of water. They have to drink. And because the water is now concentrated, the herd movements are very predictable. And I think what is more indicative of that is that these old boys are not being taken out nearly as much as youngsters from the herd and that means the herd is moving in a predictable fashion and that the lions are following the herd so these chaps don't form part of a herd anymore they're just a group of slightly miserable old bachelors sorry that box that you saw there which we don't need to look at again uh, is part of the power for the Juma camera as far as I'm aware and you can watch the Juma camera at night and that box will provide you with light.
he is just standing in the sun, which is a strange thing to do on a day like today. The clouds are building, and they certainly the, the day began with a lot of cloud in the sky, and it was the most glorious morning. We had those kind of big um, dark grey clouds sort of building, and then they'd dissipate, and the light would come through, and then they'd come back over, and I just love those kinds of days. It gets warm, but it never gets too hot, and you can feel the air. The air starts to feel very close in anticipation of possible rain. All right, let us leave these beefs to themselves and we'll head on to see what else we can find. So the question as to why they are on their own like this is, is clearly to be asked. Why are they not with the herd anymore? And Pamela, you say, oh, they've passed their prime. They are without question past their prime. They're, um, they're old, they're starting to lose it a bit physically, and for them to stay in a herd and compete for mating opportunities is just a bit more trouble than it's worth at the moment. If a herd came through here, it's quite possible that they'd join up for a little while, and then they'd probably drop off again and form up these bachelor herds again. So they might have the odd opportunity to mate, but I don't think a huge huge one. Um, and also what happens in that, and you can see it in some of these old bulls, is that their testicles atrophy, which means that instead of having that great big swinging sack between their, their, their back legs, as the big bulls do, um, the older ones, that shrivels up and you can see immediately um, that he's probably not producing the same levels of testosterone and so he's not going to be mating anymore. summer builds, so the migratory birds come up, and we'll just have a look at very non-migratory birds, because they may well have a nest in here. Can you see the oxpeckers there? They do, they've got a nest. Now watch them, they're going in there, there's a little nest there. That's wonderful. So those are red-billed oxpeckers, and they've got a little nest. Communal nesting birds. And the one on the far right-hand side, Andrew, I don't know if you can get in a bit closer, is carrying hair. It's carrying hair from an animal that it's been sitting on, and it's going to use that to line the nest. That's very exciting. See that? Yes. That's very cool. <laughs> I've never seen that, I've just read about it. So, these are not migratory birds, but Genevieve, you like one of my favourite migratory birds, the violet-backed starling. And we actually had one the other day on the morning drive. You were probably tucked up in your bed, but they, we had a, my first sighting of a violet-backed starling a few days ago. And for those of you who don't know, a violet-backed starling is a beautiful starling species that it used to be called, much more poetically, the plum-coloured starling. That gives you an idea of what his colours are. Beautiful iridescent plum colours. And they look very black if you don't see them in the sun, but in this kind of sunlight, they'll be delightful to look at. So these oxpeckers are communal nesting. That means that uh, only two in the group will breed. The rest will help raise the clutch, line the nest. You can see that slightly younger one there. I think it's a younger one. Carrying the, the hair. Doesn't seem to know too much about what to do with it. And all of this done without any kind of speech. They help each other to find the nest, line it with hair, lay the eggs, feed the chicks. It's quite astonishing. The other bird that I haven't seen this year is a yellow weaver, any of the yellow weavers that we have here. And I think it's because we haven't had much rain yet. Certainly in Johannesburg, they're building furiously in the urban forest there. But why are they not building here yet? I haven't even seen one. I'm really not sure. I really enjoy them. And what determines the breeding pair is just simply age. 
and I think what you find with these ox peckers is it, it, that it's the younger generation possibly a year or two behind that are the helpers and eventually they'll go off and form their own flock and some of them will breed and I suppose some of them might never breed but it's the oldest pair that will be the breeding pair and they'll be mother and father probably to the rest of the flock nice right well we'll keep an eye on that nest they're obviously just in the start of the breeding season and they'll probably incubate for about 20 days or so and then there'll be a gentle or strident calling from some little naked oxpecker chicks as they get fed and demand food and hopefully they'll be safe in that tree right very nice to see I described, I described a little bit earlier the call of the red-chested cuckoo as Bit my fru, bit my fru. Now, it's an Afrikaans sort of, um, what do you call it, an on, onomatopoeic-ness. That's the best I can do, I'm afraid. Pit my fru, which means Peter, my wife. Literally. I'm not sure exactly what it means if it's not literal. Uh, but that's basically what it means. Pit may throw. Pit probably has a verbal meaning other than just the proper noun, Peter. But I'm not sure what it is. I'll try and find out. I should really know that, of course. Lovely, um, a lovely update from Ignatius in Pretoria. Um, calls himself Ich sometimes. Um, Ignatius, very nice, thank you. Uh, you said that you have read about um, cuckoos in South Africa parasitizing minor bird nests. Now, a minor bird, of course, is we call them Indian miners out here, and as its name suggests, it's not from South Africa, but it is a real problematic species in various parts of South Africa because it's invasive, it's very successful here, not much seems to, to be able to get it, and it's a starling like bird. So, those cuckoos, cuckoos that parasitize starlings probably parasitize the Indian miner as well. And I was just thinking, some of our South African viewers probably um, or may well have Afrikaans as a, um, as a native tongue or mother tongue. I Ignatius, maybe you do. Uh, and maybe we've got a viewer in Potchefstroom, of course, where the population is predominantly Afrikaans. Perhaps you could give us a bit better description of what Piet may throw is when, or where it comes from. moth flying off there that I'm not going to challenge Andrew with that just yet. Until he's warmed up. So, so far so good on our new car. Very quiet engine. No signal breakups. Today. We had a lovely walk, Andrew, Steph and I, this morning, and we saw some monkeys, some vervet monkeys. And D, you want to know why we don't see them too often? Well, D, it's because, as you say, they are the only species. And also, they are, I mean, we also heard a whole lot around the camp today, and possibly alarm calling at a leopard. Um, uh, we're going to drive, we'll drive around there and just keep our eyes open. They were alarm calling very vociferously earlier on, and they are the only monkey species that we get here. We do get baboons from time to time, but they mainly, I don't know really why we don't see them on Juma too much. They see them on Torchwood a huge amount, and certainly along the fringes of the river, where the big trees allow them, I think that's probably what it is, the big trees allow them uh, lots of different roosting positions along the Sand River. There were, I mean, when I worked at Londoloji, there were hundreds and hundreds of baboons. Have a baboon sighting just about every drive. 
but here we're away from the rivers, possibly because the lack of enormous trees for them to roost in. Uh, we don't see them very often. Highly entertaining to watch. But the only monkey species we get here is the vervet monkey, and the only species, the only other species of monkey in the country is called a Samango monkey. And we don't find them here. They generally live in very heavily forested areas like those up near the Drakensberg Mountains there or on the Natal coast of the sand forest there. Nice answer from Ich, back from us from Pretoria. You say Pit is also a way to describe a sound in Afrikaans. It would make a lot more sense than Peter, my wife. So it's just an onomatopoeic way of saying of, of saying the bird's name. So Pit may throw, no literal meaning. Thank you, Ich. You've cleared it up for me. Every day, I think I've heard it all. Um, yucky, yucky, Carolyn. Really? <laughs> yucky. Oh, I see. Okay, we've got yucky and Carolyn. All right, I'm good. That's that's much better than somebody who's called themselves yucky Carolyn. Uh, you want to know what that red thing on the front of the vehicle is? It's a very important part of the vehicle. It is the jack. If we drive over something the wheel, we, have, we of course do not have the services of the Automobile Association out here, or whatever the North American equivalent is, and so we have to use that to lift the car up, change the tyre, and then move along. The tyres that are on this new car, of course, are a bit like tank a bit like tank tracks, and so I'm not sure that we the tree exists that could stick a thorn through them. I may be wrong, but I'm hoping that we won't have to use that jack at all for very long. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and a warning from Paul Rizzo who says I better be careful with the, the Wild Earth new vehicle, or Graham's new vehicle. Yes, Paul, I'd better. Um, but I'm afraid once the wild dogs start hunting, my fear of scratching the new paintwork, and I, like I say, I use the term new advisedly, um, well, my fear of dirting it will disappear really fast. Wild dogs go on the hunt. lot of questions today, especially when we set off on foot early this morning, about what it is or what animals that are potentially dangerous and <laughs> looking at animals in the eye. Excuse me. I <laughs> <coughs> uh, sorry, brief coughing. I'm okay. No one can. Thank you, Andrew, for your care and attention <laughs> during my, my coughing fit. A lot of discussion. Sorry about that, we are back online 
a couple of adjustments we had to make and we went through a bit of a dodgy signal area but here we are so straight back on to Ashley's question about the monkeys and whether if you look them in the eye they are likely to attack you uh, Ashley, I'd say of all the animals out here, uh, the ones that I wouldn't look in the eye of, of the ones that I would think would be the most challenged by, challenged by a direct look in the eye, I'd say the monkeys were them. That said, um, I've never been in a position where I've looked at a monkey in the eye and it has attacked me. Um, and that's normally because monkeys will run away. Now, monkeys are chauvinists of the highest order. And they will attack women long before they'll attack men and it's quite interesting to see I used to work with a fairly substantial woman in fact a number of substantial women who were taller than me and um, you know so they were just bigger than me all round and the monkeys would go for them and they'd leave me alone completely so they had not to do with size they can tell the difference between male and female human beings and they tend to be a lot more aggressive towards females and I would say that staring them in the eye is probably not the best bet in the world. Now our little pod of hippopotamus which was six two days ago was four yesterday has gone down to just two. Interesting and on the back end of the hippo there uh, that is a hammerkop or hammerhead. Very interesting bird which builds a nest that weighs up to a hundred kilograms. I get to see one here though. I haven't seen a hammerkop since the view, Andrew. One or two? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I haven't seen one here. So those two hippopotamus hiding from the sun and you can see they're lying down there and you can see to the right hand side of the one on the right there is actually a piece of mud sticking up. This is not deep water. The water is running out at a fairly rapid rate and I don't think it's too long before this particular water hole goes completely dry. Now that is not said to make anybody panic about the state of affairs here. That's pretty normal. And there is still water in the Sand River, which is to the south of us. And there is still water in any number of other artificially pumped water holes around the Sabi Sands. And it's a bit of a moot point because an area like this could do every so often with a good drought where there is some animal die-off and as unpleasant as that may sound, uh, what it does is give the bush a chance to recover and recuperate and some of the animals like um, elephants which can move to water they will clean out the place a bit and I mean it does look fairly devastating after a nasty drought but when the wind rain comes after that um, you know the cycles begin again and we don't have those times anymore where there are large-scale mammal die-offs because we've put water all over the place and that's created a whole suite of interesting ecological conundrums. And as with so many things in nature, where we think we understand the system, we make some kind of intervention only to find that, well, that everything is just a bit worse than when we first started. And there's no more classic example of that. classic examples of that kind of thing going on than in the Kruger National Park where you know over the 60s science so-called was used to justify the placing of water holes in various parts of the Kruger Park uh, in order to just you know make more animals come survive and make things good for them what it did was to increase impala and zebra it destroyed the population of roan and sable antelope elant and other and probably hartebeest too, which can move to water but cannot survive under the competition from zebra and impala. It's a classic example of it there. As we look at this drying water, of course those buffalo are still enjoying the benefits of the mud that will no doubt become even more magnificent as, the, as it's uncovered by the evaporating water. Do you want to know how many water holes we've had dry up here? D. Um, well, there's been Treehouse Dam, Twin Dams, and B B not Bifosuka, Juma Dam. They've all dried out, and so three here. I'm not sure how many on some of the other reserves. There you can see the mud, and you can perhaps see a little terrapin. Can you see the terrapin there, Andrew? No, sorry, you were on the dove. There's a terrapin in that kind of fairly disgusting looking slick bit there. You can see his head. 
there, that's in there. That's the terrapin, everyone. A serrated, hinged terrapin, looking for little things to eat. Quite voracious carnivores are the serrated, hinged terrapin. Oh, there's another hippo there. There are actually three hippos. One's a youngster at the back. Hmm. Right, I was hoping that some elephants would uh, join us here for a bit of a drink. But as I said, the elephants will spend less and less time in these kind of green, slimy parts of water because they prefer much cleaner water if they can get it. Okay. Right, Andrew, on we go. The Hummercorp's favourite food, of course, is frogs. Um, of which there won't be too many around here. I haven't heard any frogs here, actually. They also prefer the kind of freshly, um, newly developed pans, ponds. Yeah. This car does have a reverse gear, doesn't it, Andrew? It's a bit just, tricky. Just not right now. Smooth and easy, James. Smooth and easy. There we go. Sorry, while I was trying to get the car into reverse, um, I, what sounded like quite an amusing comment from Heidi Raggedy Ann Donna came through. I'm just not sure what it was. It'll come back to me now. Stand by. Oh, I see. Sorry. It wasn't an amusing, wasn't amusing comment at all. It was just an observation that there were three hippos. Thank you for the, th the three of you. I think you spotted that there were three before I did. Now, which is a bit embarrassing given that I'm actually s was sitting right next to them. Thank you for that, Heidi, Raggedy Ann, and Donna. Glad you're more awake than I am right now. White browed scrub robin. You got in there? No. Alright, sorry, there was a white browed scrub robin in there, very difficult to see. We don't often see them, but we hear them all the time, so when the chance comes to try and film one, I get rather excited and then put the cameraman on the spot. And um, well, then I blame him, of course, for not finding it. Andrew, why didn't you find it? Sorry, Jerry. <laughs> And we, of course, have those damn cameras. There was one at Biffelsook. One of our viewers told me. I didn't know that we had had one before at Biffelsook, um, but we did. We don't have one there anymore. We've got them at Arethusa, and in fact, in many places around the world. With Arethusa and Juma are the main ones in this area. And sorry, I'm just looking at the ground here for some tracks. Um, Charlotte in Port Elizabeth, you go to sleep to the sound of the Juma Dam Cam. Now, you want to know if the sound is actually magnified slightly by the by uh, the microphones. Oh, there's some zebra. Charlotte, I don't think it's magnified, but it is, of course, you're sitting right next to the only water in the place, so it will be louder. It will seem slightly louder than it does to us, but rather like, rather like the fact that you can sleep next to a highway if that's where you sleep all the time. You stop noticing the noise. So we stop noticing the noise of the night out here. And so it's not too difficult to sleep in it and it's the most wonderful thing to go to sleep to. And I'm sure that's exactly why you have it on at night to help you lull, lull yourself into a bush felt sleep. There are some zebra. Uh, that is probably an obvious statement to most of you. If you didn't know that this was a zebra, welcome to your first sighting. And this is a little kinship group grazing its way through the woodland. And the kinship group is the basic social structural, social fabric of a zebra. One stallion, big and strong, there to defend, and his wives, normally two or three mares and their associated offspring. And he will move 
at the front or the back of the herd depending on where the threat is most likely to come from. I'll just roll gently back. This car actually rolls, the other two don't roll at all. They've got arthritis. There they are. Just going off into the woodland. And disappearing. Now I use the term woodland uh, not simply because uh, it's, a, it's a nice word. It is in fact what we call this. Now many, when people think of Africa, they think of the Lion King, uh, Pride Rock and the endless plains of the Serengeti, which are a kind of, um, they're a habitat type known as savanna, and that's predominantly grass with the odd tree spiking up out of it, and that would be called savanna. This kind of habitat here, which predominates in the Kruger National Park, is what we'd call open or broad-leafed woodland. And it's a, it's a very kind of, it's not closed, but it's definitely not grassland, and it's definitely too closed to be savannah. Oh dear, I pushed a button. <laughs> it might happen again. There we go, we're okay. Sorry about that. New car, new car. Looking at some hippopotami, and people often ask me, would I would I swim in Bifelzuk Dam um, if there were no hippopotami there? And the answer is no, because there could be a crocodile there. Uh, there isn't a crocodile there, as far as I'm aware. But the students of Miss Cluddy's class in Michigan, lovely to have you with us. Very glad that you are talking to us. I'm not sure how old you are, so perhaps Miss Cluddy, you might like to send through a message as to how old your kids are. It's very good to have young enthusiasts of the wilderness with us on the vehicle and you ask a very good question. You ask, would it... Sorry, I'm just being interrupted by a crested Franklin there. I will get back to you about your crocodile and hippo question now. You see them, Andrew? Mm -hmm. Beautiful crested Franklin. Most common Franklin species that we get out here. I'm not sure why they're called crested, to be brutally honest. I don't see, never notice the crest on them. But you can see that, that really nice example of their camouflage with that brown, sort of white mottled feathering. Beautiful birds. Mm. They're a bit like the impala of the bird world, you know. They get kind of, we hear them every morning and chase them off the road when we're driving at great speed to find wild dogs and leopards. But when you stop and actually look at them, especially in this kind of late afternoon sun, it's just very marvellous indeed. Mm. Well, so while we look at that Franklin's Cluddy's kids, you wanted to know, are there crocodiles there? The answer is no, I don't believe there are. But if there were, would there be a fight between the hippo and crocodile? And if so, who would win? Um, <laughs> this is a, uh, it tells me that your kids are probably quite young. This is a common question for young enthusiasts of nature as to who would be faster or who would be stronger or who would win a fight. Um, it depends really on the size of the hippo and the size of the crocodile. But what you find is that big crocodiles will try and go for hippo babies and they will normally be fairly swiftly dispatched or beaten up by hippo cows. Crocodiles, unless they are truly enormous, will avoid hippos because hippos are bigger, they're heavier, and they're not necessarily faster, but they've certainly got enormous teeth and they can do some real damage to crocodiles. So they can actually live together relatively peaceably 
because the hippos tend to avoid the crocs. It's a really nice sighting of a crested franklin. He's wandering along there trying to pick up grass seeds to eat. And perhaps the odd insect. And they're often the first bird that you hear in the morning and often the last diurnal bird that you hear before it gets dark. All right, let's drive along, see what else we can find. We're now on the far eastern side of Juma. And what we're going to do is head to the deep, deep south and see what we can find there. And then we might pop across to Arethusa. I'm just going to try and find out Brent where he is and what he's doing and what his plans are. Because we can't send more than one across to Arethusa. we are alone out here um, this is because Brent and Wendy and he is called Wendy is being fixed by Brent and Eugene I suspect Brent is uh, providing lots of free advice to Eugene and probably becoming increasingly frustrated because he really loves hates to be um, encumbered by a non-working vehicle he loves to be out in the bush finding different things I think therefore we will definitely head across to Arethusa and just see if we can't get an update on what happened with Tingana and Shadow and their uh, potential creation of a, a new generation of young leopards. Lots of discussion, as I said early this morning, about the vicious poisonous spiders and snakes, of which there are relatively few out here. And likewise, there are also relatively few poisonous plants. And Junebug, you want, you want to know if we all here have poison ivy or poison oak. Junebug, we don't. We do get nettles, stinging nettles sometimes, and they can cause a bit of a nasty tickle on the legs if you walk through them. But that's about as bad as it gets, really. Uh, if you get some of the poisonous sap from a euphorbia tree, uh, euphorbia is like the African equivalent of a on your skin, it can cause a bit of blistering. It's not very pleasant. Um, but otherwise, very little. There's nothing in the way. There's nothing like a poison ivy or poison oak that causes any trouble here. These could be rushing across the road at high speed. Let's just stop there, have a look at them. Deeply surprised looking kudu calf, not calf, cow. And I learnt something really fascinating today from Stefan. They have what's termed a flicker response that is much slower than ours. So I didn't know what a flicker response was, or I didn't know, I knew what it was, but I didn't know that's what it was called. If you, obviously, you all know you've tried to hit a fly, if, and it's been bugging you, and astonishingly, they always seem to manage to escape being hit, and that's because they have an incredibly fast flicker response. They can see things coming much more quickly than we can. Now, likewise, apparently kudu are pretty slow. All the tragulaphids, which are kudu, nyala, bushbuck, in this area, and then also bongo and eland, um, they have a much slower flicker response. And you can tell that, and Andrew was agreed that when we drive up to kudu, often they kind of stand and they look at you for a while before they seem to realize that you've come, and then they move off. Now, why they should have that response, I'm not really sure. But they definitely, when you think about it, and when you've seen them a lot, absolutely, they seem to respond a lot slower than you would expect. Certainly slower than impala or zebra or other animals like that. Now, whether that has an effect on the number of them that get smacked by lions, I don't know. They don't seem to be a favoured prey species for lions out here, interestingly. 
they get taken once every so often, but not, not in huge numbers. Not like the buffalo or the impala. Right there. I thought we'd lost Andrew briefly. Right. A nice kudu eating the fresh new leaves. We'll leave them and press on. Oh dear, I've got to push this button again. There we go. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry about the horn that was blasted earlier. Uh, Vicky and Afua, you say we need to get Opar to disconnect it. Now, Opar is the me mechanic here, and Afua, you, you point out that Opar means grandfather in Afrikaans. Now, Opar is anything but a grandfather. He's probably about 30 years old. Um, strapping young fellow. And it's in very, it's actually open, I know you, you, you're, you're making a very good suggestion, but it brings up an interesting topic. So a lot of the people out here, the Shangan people, have got names like that. I've met a cement, Matibula. I've met a sixpence, Matibula. Um, I have met a uh, custard, um, and a breakfast, and indeed a Friday. Now these strange names that people are called out here normally stem either from nicknames, and I think Opaz is actually a nickname, but often, because of our turbulent past of apartheid, people were they'd give, given their, their local name, so they would have a, a local Shanga name at birth, and then they would be given some kind of an English name, so that the when they went off to the towns or the mines, and their bosses wouldn't have to struggle with a local name, because they didn't usually speak the, the local language. And so they'd be given an English name, which might be, or, or an Afrikaans name in Opa's case. Um, I'm pretty sure that his is a is a nickname. It may have been given to him by his father, but it may, I think it's a nickname. But certainly lots of older men, you see these astonishing names, um, like Sixpence, or Breakfast, or Friday, or Custard. And that's, that's a tradition through which Opa would have got his name. He will have, he will unquestionably have a Shanga name as well though. Everybody calls him Opa. And yes, I'm, I'm going to ask him to disconnect the hole. I'm also going to ask him to disconnect the immobilizer. The reason it went off, of course, is that um, it's got an immobilization device that you can't, it's not supposed to be able to start the car unless you, you push it. And <laughs> there was some talk the other day that it was going to cost 15,000 Rand to have the thing disconnected. And so, you know, we're just going to have to live with them. Opa, of course, giggled heartily at that when Brentia Smith told him, and he just disconnected the immobilizer on Jigger in less than five minutes. So Jigger no longer has an immobilizer. We'll get him to do the same with this car. in Texas, I think it's Caroline. An interesting question. <laughs> oh, there we go. Right. Sorry, not Caroline at all. Earline. Earline? <laughs> Earline. <laughs> I will, I will gather my, I will gather myself. At this point, we should probably cross the bridge, but unfortunately, he's not live. So I'll, I'll try and gather myself. Earline. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the correct pronunciation. Please excuse my slight rudeness. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just, a, I've, I've not heard the name Earline before. What? <laughs> Oh, a uh, lead. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's called. Uh, yeah, but that makes more sense. Anyway, uh -huh. E A R L I N E in Texas, 
Um, thank you for joining us. Please forgive us laughing at your name. Um, it's not fair of us. We just don't know how to pronounce it. So I'm very sorry about it. But you have a very interesting and valid question to ask. And it is the following. Ticks and fleas in Texas cause a lot of animal deaths. And is that not the case out here? Surely it is. Not with the wild animals though. So, with the domestic stock that we have out um, in the communities here, they get dipped. The government comes in and dips them once a week. That's how often they need to be dipped against the parasites, ticks and fleas and other things that get onto the skin and cause disease. Now the wild animals have a much greater resistance to disease and so they're far less affected by it. That said, they are affected by it, but they have various methods of getting rid of ticks and fleas. Now, one of those, of course, is the ox peckers, and you've seen the ox peckers sitting on the, on the animals, eating away the ticks and birds, not the birds, eating away the ticks and fleas. And then also, animals spend a long time self-grooming themselves. If you'll watch Impala, they've actually got a specialized tooth that uh, is called a tick tooth and it moves. It's, qu it's quite loose in the jaw and it allows them to scrape off different ticks and if you watch them pile up any length of time you can actually see them uh, scraping off the ticks and then lots of animals like buffalo and rhino and warthog will go into the water and spray mud on themselves let that mud dry and when the clay dries it pulls the ticks mouth parts out of the skin and then they rub it off on a rubbing post or a tree so yes it does cause a problem but Erlene which I think is a much better way of pronouncing your name um, they certainly do cause a problem but not so much amongst the wild animals here here are some impala let's see if we can see them using their special grooming tooth There, when you see them, you can see them, they're flicking their heads back sometimes and scratching. Obviously none of the ones in actual camera are going to do it. There are a couple in the main herd who I've just seen doing it, and that's using that special tooth. There, you may have seen it there. Just turning around, having a big scratch there, open the bottom jaw and scratch away. And of course the tail, let's not forget the humble tail of various animals out here plays a huge role in getting rid of different kind of parasites. And I mean the whippy nature of a giraffe's or um, zebra's tail makes a huge difference to the number of parasites that would be on the skin. And there's a school of thought as we look at those impala and um, just on, along the lines there of the same topic that kind of brown patch at the back end there of an impala is supposed is probably warmer than the rest of the impala because it obviously is it's darker and so it will radiate heat better and it will also absorb more heat than the lighter parts of the impala and there's a thought that that attracts insects and ticks and you can see that it's right in the way of the tail and so the ticks all are attracted to that particular part of the body and then the tail, as you can see it wagging there, pushes those off. That's quite an interesting thought. It's difficult to know why else it would have that, um, that dark patch or those two dark stripes on either side of the tail. If you're ever on safari in, in Africa, and I've said this before, and you get that view that you're looking at now, and your guide says to you, that is the Ma McDonald's of the bush, um, what you should do is instruct him to drive you straight back to the lodge and then insist upon another, another guide. Terrible joke, that McDonald's of the bush. I think it's been told in Africa possibly since the Pyramid of Cheops was built. Right, we are now on the far southeastern corner, and I think we're going to head deep west now into Arethusa, terra incognito, and we'll see if we can't get an update on those two leopards. Right, on we go. So, we were 
watching the oxpeckers earlier in their nest and we've had a bit of a discussion about their effect on mammals with ticks and Daniel in Ohio brilliantly has remembered that yesterday we saw an oxpecker and it was really interesting to pick the tick off an animal and it was shaking it around basically breaking the skin and then sucking the blood out of the tick and that is because Because oxpeckers don't necessarily eat um, ticks for ticks, they like like the ticks because of the blood that the ticks suck out of animals. Oxpeckers will often keep the injury open in order. Oh, look at the little one. Tiny little baby there. memory geniuses and I'm not sure where the legend comes from I don't think compared with some kind of a human memory is probably actually really good and they certainly have to learn a huge amount especially in areas where there isn't obvious water like there is around to
Stations is a small breeding herd of elephants just to, on Gari Main Road, both sides of the road, about 200 metres to the east of junction with Twin Downs Road. So, sorry about that, I'm not sure what you've heard and what you haven't heard, but some of you have been with us all afternoon, of course, and you've seen that we made a bit of a hooting noise, a horn noise, if you happen to be in America or Canada. And Barbara, you want to know, probably slightly, not facetiously, but probably tongue-in-cheek, would it make a difference if I started hooting the horn in this herd of elephants? It would make a big difference, Barbara. They wouldn't like that at all. So I'll be fairly circumspect about starting the engine. There's a lovely little one in there. There's a smaller one just ahead of it. And I'll just kind of roll forward and see if we can't get a look. that it's something specific. You won't just be digging for the sake of it. It's a really lovely herd of elephants, this. And I tell you, to be able to park in the middle of them like this is just spectacular. I mean, obviously we're aware on both sides of the road where they are and what they're doing, but... <laughs> but they don't seem to be affected by us at all. There's a little one coming out now. Very sweet. Very cross. thinking about crossing the road, looking left and right as his mother's always told him to do. And you'll notice on the back end of the tails of elephants are a lot of hairs. And sometimes the only hair that an elephant has, especially when it gets a bit older, is the hair on the end of its tail. And Geoffrey and Austin, very good question, what on earth is the purpose of an elephant's tail? Uh, that hair is a very effective fly swatter, so I think it's purely to move nasty parasites off the body. Let's sneak a little bit further. And Ashley, country girl Ash, do elephants. Why are we just sneaking forward here? Just going to be careful. Um, we saw the little one moving there. Oh, yeah. He was moving on his own and Come not more. with any of his Come cohorts. On, and of course, m of course, many look at him there. Many young elephants have been seen in movies, normally cartoons, apparently holding each other's tails. And country girl Ash, you want to know, does this actually happen? No, it doesn't. 
they do sometimes hold on to its tail, their tails, but not, not for any length of time. They do do. If you watch these two greeting now, they will sometimes put their trunks into each other's mouths, and they will. <laughs> being thoroughly bullied there. And there's a little one. See, putting the trunk in the mouth there to say hi and just coming to make sure that everyone's okay and nobody's being too nasty to anyone else. Isn't that fascinating? That really is amazing to me. They are so like human beings, it's incredible. So it's just like an older brother coming in, two youngsters having a bit of a fight with each other, the older one coming in saying, hang on, hang on, hang on, just calm down, everyone relax, we're all okay. And then another one coming in to say the same thing. Isn't that great? Ah, oh, that's wonderful. She's sitting not very far from a much larger elephant, but we're not going to, we're just going to keep an eye on these two youngsters. They're about 100 meters, in, well, 80 meters in front of us. Isn't that wonderful? In a proper old box. And it's just so like if you're in a group of people and there are two young boys and sometimes two young girls, definitely if they're two young boys of sort of similar ages, maybe five and six years old, they're going to eventually, if you leave them alone for long enough, they're going to get into a tangle precisely like these two elephants are. Very similar kind of a situation. This is just spectacular. There is a vehicle coming past us. Um, so if they do react, that'll be what it is reacting at. It does astonish me while we're watching these elephants. There are some people who've just come in on a game drive. They've totally ignored the elephants. They've seen Andrew on a camera and they've stared at him as if he was a pack of wild dogs killing an elephant. Look how beautiful they are. And you can, I don't know if you managed to hear that, but there was a wonderful sound, a deep rumbling of them calling. Let's sneak a little bit further forward. There's a very substantial elephant next to us here, and he's now... Well, he's probably about hmm, eight meters away. Not very far at all. Let's stop and watch him for a while. He's eating a very thorny bush called the called Dicrostachus cinerea, or the sickle bush. And he's quite big. Oh, Andrew, sorry, I'm going to have you. Can we go back to the little ones? The little ones there. <laughs> and a little cousin or sister helping out. So sweet. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sneak a little bit closer because this is just <laughs> this is too this is too marvellous for words. Let's go a little bit closer. Just hope this big elephant next to us doesn't climb onto Andrew's lap. Andrew, if you can onto your lap, let me know. I'll stop. What a big boy. Oh, 
something's given them a bit of a fright. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not really sure, I don't really understand what happened there, to be honest. Something gave them a big fright. The little one now, he's in full attack mode. Giving him. He was having a go at that other game drive, and these young elephants do that. They have a go at each other, they have a go at, they test their strength, they see, well, want to see what makes them afraid and what doesn't. you can hear this but they're making a lot of those infrasonic rumbles just comforting each other and um, something gave them a fright not anything particularly terrifying I don't think but they're making a lot of those infrasonic rumbles that we can't hear we can just hear the top end of them it's just wonderful and as many of you are saying just so incredibly sweet so cute First of all, they're talking to each other a huge amount. We were watching those little ones playing and then being just kind of shepherded and nurtured by the youngsters, well, not the youngsters, but the sort of teenagers, slightly older. And as we look at that tiny little one there, Vicky, you make the point that elephants, you have never ceased to be amazed by the compassion and intelligence of ele elephants. I have to agree with you, and especially you know, in this last stint of mine being out here in the bush, I have been consistently astonished at the amazing sightings we've had, A, and how, ooh, look at this chap here, <laughs> on his knees. Such human things, and I think that's why we find them so emotionally engaging, and we can see an intelligence in them, which is just gives us an attachment to them, that perhaps isn't as obvious in some of the other animals. This one has been walking through some very scratchy bushes during the course of the day. You can see that from the bits of sort of white striping. It's like when you scratch your skin and it's very dry. It has that kind of dry bits of skin come off and it leaves a line. It's exactly the same thing is happening here. Just keeping an eye out all over the place. There, there's another five or six past behind us across the road. There are a whole lot more way up in the distance I can see coming across the road as well. So there's a huge amount of activity going on on the road here. Elephants galore. And I was just saying yesterday how I felt like they'd all moved away. We were looking, seeing them around every corner. And now, here we are again. A lovely view of the feet there. And another vehicle coming in and that's why they're just reacting slightly. It's not any kind of uh, particularly angry threat behavior. It's just a bit of noise, so the elephants will react slightly. How's it going? Good. We are on a fairly major access road here. Now that elephant is now probably five meters from us, so 15 feet or so, and eating something called zebra wood. And if there's ever anything that's going to go through the tires on this brand new car, 
it'll be a zebra wood. But with very spiky thorns, it doesn't seem to affect the elephant at all, and they love zebra wood. Oh, another whole lot coming across the little one here. This is one of the little ones that was diving around in the sand there a little bit earlier. making the point of how similar to human beings they are. And look. See how close he is. And he's not worried by us, he's just interested. There you go. Isn't that marvelous? Tossing a bit of sand around. And just along the lines of how human they are in so many respects, Curious one, you say that the littlest one is a bit like your younger brother, starts the trouble and then you get blamed. I think it's pretty much the same in every family, really. My sister certainly ha had the same privilege, so she's much younger than me, started a lot of trouble. I took a lot of blame for it. She'd probably tell you the opposite. She'd be wrong. It's, he's back onto the zebra wood there, definitely selecting that. And that tree, of course, grows into a furniture or a planking tree. I mean, you can plank it. In the absence of elephants, it makes beautiful uh, zebra-coloured wood, black and white, gorgeous heartwood. But out here, not so much. And in fact, it has been used quite a lot to make musical instruments like clarinets. But you wouldn't make much of a piccolo out of that tree. And that's because the elephants keep breaking it and then it grows from the base and it never has a chance to actually grow a proper trunk. slightly. Our new friend from Texas, or perhaps not new, um, Erlin, I'm not sure how long you've been watching, but marvellous to hear from you, Erlin in Texas. You love the way they eat their feet. Uh, it is really fascinating. What a vicious fellow. Don't worry about us, I'm just coming to have a look at you. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't very nice of me to move actually. Let's go a little bit forward again. So, Erlene, that's how we're going to pronounce your name unless we hear anything otherwise. We shall not pronounce it Earline ever again. Ah, thank you, Erlene, for emailing us and explaining that to us before we insulted you. We do seem to be on something of a major highway at the moment. Sorry about that. Not much we can do about it. forward out of Doug's way. There we go. Yeah, you like them. They won't look like this for long. That was Doug just uh, admiring the, the new wheels. Yeah, we're back with this youngster eating his zebra wood. trees still taking a hammering from the elephants. The elephants, of course, will ideally eat grass when the vegetation, well, when the rains come because they prefer the softer vegetation. But at this time of the year, there's no really green grass, no long green grass because we haven't had proper rain yet. And so they must eat the trees still, which is okay. Trees have all flushed. 
lots of good stuff to eat. Right, let us roll gently along the road. There is another herd, well, way up on the other crest there. I just want to get within sort of um, radio distance of Arethusa so we can get an update on those leopard uh, on the off chance that they're around and we're able to go and see them. So that's what we're going to do. Still not... a lot on this road, you know, as Gerda is pointing out, thank you Gerda, um, you're absolutely right, we do seem to see quite a lot on this road. Uh, you say it, it always makes you think of wild dogs, for me it makes me think of my first sighting in quarantine, which was exactly where we had those elephants there, and often elephants and buffalo and all sorts coming across here, and that also was exactly where we had our first sighting on wild earth, well, no, not the first one on wild earth, but our first um, sighting of the real takeover of the Birmingham boys. The first time we heard them shouting and roaring next to us. Brent was there, I was on foot nearby for a while, and then we appreciated and marveled at these five young males coming in. And that was the last time, of course, that we saw them as timber males on Juma. So, yep, you're absolutely right, Get a lot's going on here. You, do, you will hear a little bit of rattling going on and that is because um, our new car has got exceptionally hard shock absorbers. Uh, the jack isn't quite tied down enough and the aerial is a little rattly. Tro troubleshooting, of course nothing like the troubles poor old Brentley Smith is having as we speak. Storm clouds building there, Andrew. Yes, wonderful. Marvellous. Do you think that they will deposit some rain on us today? Hopefully, sir. So, so. Hopefully. I'll tell you what, have you got some duct tape? You do. And gaffer tape. Everybody, I'm afraid I can take that rattling sound no longer. I'm just going to fix it quickly. Because we don't have rent, you're going to have to watch me do it. Don't worry, I shan't take long. not going to work, is it? I may have uh, taken a bit too much off there. <laughs> a little bit too eager. A little bit eager. There we go. That's going to make a big difference. The cuckoo calling in the background there. <gasps> not that. That wasn't a cuckoo, that was Andrew. Um, some kind of dread disease that he's now going to give to me. Um, the cuckoo that you can hear there is a black cuckoo going, I'm so sad. The black cuckoo. And just arrived back. I started hearing them a little about, well, about four days ago. All right. Door shuts on this car. It's remarkable. There you go. Ah. Soundless motion, Andrew. You see that? I fixed my jack, now you fix your area. Not so much. the fact that the one, one of the highlights of my morning with Andrew and Steph on foot today was that we had the return of the European bee eaters. They make a lovely chirruping call and if you've never seen the European bee eater I'll show you a picture just now. They're, they're like little F-16 fighters with very beautifully coloured gold and blue and green birds and they fly very high and go choop, 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 choop. And that made me think immediately of course of Larry's bird the Woodland Kingfisher. And Larry, we haven't heard any yet. They should be back, I think, probably around about this week. So, hopefully fairly soon. <laughs> uh, 
back again. An inquiry that is not uncommon from our younger viewers. Uh, Cameron, aged just five years old, thank you again for your question. Has a bird ever pooped upon me? Cameron? Yes, a bird has pooped on me, probably three or four times. Never really in an enormous amount, but I did have a girlfriend at one stage of my life, believe it or not, and she went running one day and she put her earphones in, and this was down the road at Londolozi. It's very silly to run in earphones in the bush because you can't hear what's coming. And she was running along listening to some song, probably not a very good one, and a hardy dog, which is a big bird like that, Cameron, exploded out of the bush in front of her. And often when animals get a big fright, what they do is that they go to the loo, they poop, they void their bowels. And this enormous bird released all of the internal parts of its waste matter, so it had a big poop and it went all over her. And she was very upset for some time. I had a quiet laugh to myself. Needless to say, we are not together anymore. that is the most difficult to master as a guide is the skill of driving and not actually looking where you're going and then not driving into anything. The actual act of driving and looking backwards isn't hard. The act of driving, looking backwards and not killing anybody is a lot harder. Um, Rudy in California, you want to know when I was driving in England, is this how I drove around? Rudy, they wouldn't let me near the wheel of any car that I went in. I thought that was a bit rude, but uh, probably a good good judgment on their part. Uh, no, I try to keep my eyes front when I'm driving in uh, town or in any any faster than we're driving now. And of course, it's crucial that you're able to do this with your guide. On those big cars, you've got six people with you, sometimes up to eight, and it's very easy to just turn like that and talk to the person sitting over here, especially if she's, if she's a pretty single girl. But She's not paying any more, of course, than the person sitting in the back seat over there. And despite the fact that that might be an angry man um, with ill intent, you still have to talk to him and look him in the eye while you're driving along. So the ability to be able to talk right to the back of the car, look to the front and not drive into anything is a very crucial part of being a guide. I, of course, thankfully have Andrew here, and if, if he goes pale, I know that I'm about to drive into something that might do us some harm. <laughs> Just like he did there. <laughs> well, there's a wonderful law called the law of the instrument, and it goes along the lines of if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem will seem to look like a nail. And the same can be applied in the modern setting to this magnificent stuff called duct tape. And Cecilia, uh, you were most impressed by my duct tape fi fixing. Thank you for that. And Erlene, you say your husband suffers from an infliction of the law of the instrument where all DIY problems are solved with some duct tape. Getting close to Arathusa now, and, and it won't be very long before I will need to excuse myself to see if we can get hold of somebody on the radio. Uh, in this vehicle, it's going to be pretty hit and miss as to whether it actually transmits the signal or not. But while we're getting there, 
a very important distinction and a great question from Grant in Illinois. Thank you, Grant. You've got deer in Illinois, obviously, and you want to know, is there any difference between them and the antelope that we get here? Huge difference. Um, a totally different sub-tribe. Um, so you get species, you get genus, you get family, and then you get tribe. Um, and the tribe of the antelope and deer is different, and the most obvious difference, I mean, they're not ecologically that different, they play a very similar role, and there are areas of South Africa where imported deer live very successfully, and certainly areas of the state, where um, I know that there are farms in Texas that have enormous numbers of wildebeest on them, for example, so they can survive there. But the major difference, the most obvious difference... Oh, hang on, I've got Brent hailing me on the radio. I'm going to stop here and just quickly give you finish what I was saying there Grant the most obvious difference of course is that a deer has antlers they fall off every year as far as I know and come back at the end of during the next breeding season and an antelope has got horns that stay its whole life long if it loses them they don't grow back I'm just going to quickly talk to Brent we're at the junction of um, Arathusa and um, now we've got some radio go traffic Oh, this is good news. Oh, okay, copy. Whereabouts are they? Oh, you're getting the update we need. Uh-huh. Good. Pump uh, house. Red dam. Red dam. Red dam. Okay. Uh, okay uh, copy. Let me call myself in there quickly before Andrew can do it. Ha ha ha. Any station, Arathusa, do you copy? Yes, I right. Oh, you're getting an answer. Marvelous. Um, can I have a vehicle lineup for the sighting of mating pair? It's a standby one available. Thank you very much. I would like to take that, please. Copy. You can speak to Jason and Darby. Uh, they in the lock there. Copy. Thanks very much. Can you just give me the position? You come on Makupunyan and Glela, just behind Red Dam in the Chukovandim. Uh, yeah, you'll pull the you go past the pump house, it's a two track that can us north. Okay, copy that. So confirm, best approach to come, my Kukunyan Road, and I'll get, once I hit the drainage line, I will get a track going there. The first is that normally you wouldn't hear this radio at all, uh, but it's not feeding through the little system into my earpiece so that I don't magically produce sightings for you without you knowing how I've done it. Um, the other is that we're on what we call second standby. So if you're a new viewer, it's important to understand that we don't like to have more than three vehicles in a sighting at a time, so that's very important. It doesn't pressurize the animals, it makes it a better experience for the guests that come out here and they're of course a crucial part of keeping the wilderness alive here. So we're on second standby, that means we are the fifth vehicle, so we're just going to drive around, see a few more things and wait for somebody else to move out of that area. I'm also just going to load my map so that I know and understand where they are. earlier about um, deer and impala and these are the good sorts of questions to have while we're heading towards hopefully a mating leopard sighting. Um, country girl Ash, you say that deer lift their tails and show white when they're alarmed so that they can follow each other and I'll do the antelope out here do it. Uh, the impala don't but the nyala and the kudu especially do exactly the same thing. Sorry about this bar, 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 bouncing around. We will try and get off this road as soon as possible. The 
drive very slowly. antelope here for the diker, which will probably disappear before we can film the governor, Andrew. There he is, careful. Doesn't know if he's, we've seen him yet, you see. Her, sorry, that's a her. No horns. There we go. Beautiful colour, brilliant colour to be out here, and it does make me wonder why on earth there aren't more animals of that colour out here. Hmm. Really good. Anyone? Very nice. Alrighty, let's go a little bit further forward. Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a recap of where we're going. There's been a lot of noise on the vehicle, um, and I'm going to refix my problem here. Um, we are going towards the sighting of a mating leopard pair, Shadow and Tingana. Let's see if this works. And Shadow and Tingana had children before, uh, or one certainly at least, his name was Sindile, is Sindile, he's currently in rehab and will hopefully be back fairly soon and we're on the way there and we are on what we call second standby which means that we have to drive around a bit, we can't go in there right now because there are more than three, well there are, there are three vehicles there, Andrew is the fourth and we will be the fifth. So eventually somebody will make space for us and we'll go in and enjoy the sighting of mating leopards with any luck. That does presume that I can find where they are. Distinctly irritating, Andrew. I'm going to state the time right to the, to the whole thing here. Everybody, this is not good DIY practice. I'm not a particularly practical human being and I also, much like Berlin's husband suffer from a condition of the law of the instrument where gaffer tape is the only tool I know how to use and even then not very effectively. There we go. It's going to be fine. Right. On we go. Ready. Ah, you hear that, Andrew? Oh, well done. You don't hear anything, do you? There we go. suggestions coming through for what else we can do with the jack. Uh, the first one I like the best, no, the second one I like the best from Erlen. Thank you. Take it off the car, drop it on the road and get Brent to come and fetch it like he did my, uh, my binoculars. That would certainly uh, at least give Brent something to do to earn his supper this evening. And then another one suggesting that we, Robin, that I take it off and put it in the car. It won't fit. Now, this is not a large Land Rover, it's small, um, and that while Andrew is not the biggest of people, the amount of equipment that there is in the back of this Land Rover is quite astonishing. There was absolutely no way it would fit in the back there without creating some kind of an enormous, uh, possibly electrical short. It was the aerial hitting a tree. <laughs> Fear not. very slowly through here. We don't want to bump into the sighting by mistake. 
Now this is very close, well not very close, but probably about 500 meters as the crow flies uh, from where Tingana was mating with Shadow's mother, Karula, about four days ago. time to just maybe help you orientate yourselves a little bit as to where in the world we are. And this is precipitated by a very good question from Pamela who wants to know, <coughs> are we, is the Sabi Sands close to the Olifants River? Uh, no, nowhere near. Pamela, um, the Olifants River, uh, the closest town, I suppose, would be closest town to the Olifants River, I suppose it would be, it would be Hootsprate, a dubious settlement just to the northeast of us, west of us here, um, and it's not close to us at all. The nearest private reserve to there would be the, it's a private reserve to the Olifants, and then it goes straight through the Kruger National Park, so it's quite a long way to the north of the Sabi Sands. Sabi Sands main rivers, unsurprisingly, are the Sabi River and the Sand River! There we go, Sand River. Oh, there are some people having drinks. How very nice of them. Might go and join them. It's thirsty work without Brentia Smith out here. Yeah. We'll just turn this way so that we don't disturb them. Um, so, Pamela, we are... The Kruger National Park is in the northeastern section of South Africa. Um, and it's a bit a boot. So if you can imagine, I'm not going to do it with my hands, I might try and draw you a map just now. Um, in fact, yes, I haven't done that for a while. I'll, I'll tell you what, while we're waiting for this leopard sighting, let me draw you a map of where we are and how we are, and I'll show you the major rivers of the Kruger National Park. It's a really important part of where and how and what goes on in the Kruger Park. Now, I must warn you, for those of you who haven't seen me do this before, uh, my skills as an artist are, well, they're just frankly poor. So, it might look totally ridiculous to you. Andrew, I'm going to do it over there. Can you get that little patch of dirt in? Yes. Right, marvellous. Well done. Okay, everybody. I will draw your map. It's come in. The leopards are waiting for you. Shout loudly. I will hear you and I will come back. Now, good? Yes. Work for you here? Yes. Right, there is the frame of my art. I will do a quick map of South Africa, just to give you a vague idea of how it works. I never know which way this thing goes. It goes like that. No, it doesn't. It's the other way. <laughs> Something like that. That is a really terrible <laughs> map of South... <laughs> Don't laugh, Andrew. Terrible map of South Africa. Cape Town is here. Johannesburg is here. Pretoria is here. Durban is here. Port Elizabeth is here. My mum and dad live here in Kenton-on-Sea. You don't need to worry about that. <laughs> the Kruger National Park is in this section here of South Africa. That's the Kruger. Right, now we will zoom in a little bit. <laughs> and I will draw a larger scale map of the Kruger National Park. Kruger Park is something like this. Can you still see that? Yes. Not like a large boot. Doing. Something like that. Uh, and we sit over here on a private reserve called the Sabi Sands. Well, pretty much in the boot there. 
There's a little reserve called the Manuleti over here and the Timbavati over there. Now the major rivers that go through the Kruger Park are as follows. In the top here, the mighty Limpopo, which forms the border. This is Mozambique and that is Zimbabwe. Then the next biggest one is the Lubuvu, which goes like that. The next biggest one, Pamela, is the Ulifants. No, sorry, I'm talking rubbish. It's the Lataba, which goes through there. Then there's the Ulifants, another big one. And the Sand River is not really very big at all. Um, but there's, so there's no really major river until you get to the Sabi River, which is this boundary here. The Sand River cuts in, it's not too far from here, cuts down into the Sabi there. Like that, it actually joins at the, jo at the Kruger Park boundary, sorry, somewhere around there. And then this one here is called the Crocodile River. So those are the major rivers of the Kruger National Park. And we're sitting here on the western fringes in the Sabi Sands and actually on the western fringes of the Sabi Sands. How do you like that, Andrew? Nice artwork, Picasso. Thank you very much. I once had a. Um, what about you? What's your luck, I, I once had a report from yeah, an art teacher at school, which said um, his work lacks finish, and right, we um, had. Uh, he was referring to a, a clay, a clay sort of project uh, that we did, uh, and um, I made a beer mug for my father, which uh, okay, I thought was very nice of me. Unfortunately, it didn't, in fact, hold liquid. Um, so it wasn't, I think lacking finish was quite a kind description of my beer mug. Right. Still no chance for us to get into the leopard sighting just yet. But fear not, be patient everyone, as I must. Um, and, oh, you know what we need to do, Andrew? Spotlight. We do need to fix the spotlight. Okay, so while we're sitting here, let's attach the spotlight. People, I'm sorry about all the maintenance that we have to do today, but there really isn't... Ah! Okay, sorry. Brent, Brent is about to get up and running, so we don't need to do the maintenance just yet. We do have to stick a spotlight onto the battery, we won't see it. So Brent apparently is about to get moving, um, and we'll do that while he's getting moving, with any luck. What I do need to do is just check the map of exactly where they are. Marvellous things, these GPS's. Oh, for goodness sakes, here we go. Brent is mobile. I think he's got a view of the Democratic Republic of the Congo or something odd like that. We'll hand you to him and see you just now. with you for a bit longer and Eugenius has managed to figure out uh, what was wrong. Unfortunately, uh, in doing so, um, we do have an open game drive mic. It seems like our radio comms were interfering with our signal. So we're going to be operating on an open radio and a handheld. So hopefully it works. So we're just not sure what's going on out there. So we're just going to bumble around and see what we can find. Uh, hopefully we'll have a little more success on Juma than James did a bit earlier. But I know you guys are waiting for something special on that side. I'm a little bit jealous. I was actually on my way there when our tech problem arose. Maybe we can find some Ellie's. I wouldn't mind some Ellie's. Brian, elephants? Mm. There you go. Nice. Fantastic Ellie sighting with James. And from that Ellie sighting, Hilda, who's from Antwerp in Belgium, the home of diamonds. Well, not the home of diamonds, but I think that's where the, all the diamonds go to be seen and sized and graded and whatnot. Uh, Hilda's 
wondering how many f***ing calves can a female ice climb. Oh, I'm a bit rusty on this, but if I remember correctly, it's five or six. And most most of the time, those are raised to adulthood. So even though they might not have that many babies in their lifetime, they're very successful mothers. And we will work it out. Middle from middle 65, probably has her first baby around 15 or 16. We need five. Yeah, so probably about six would be my guess. I will double check that a little later in my large book should have some information on how many calves she has, but if my memory serves me correctly, it should be around five or six. Oh, and we have a pair. I'm talking about babies and making babies. And I know James is on standby for some baby makers. And we've got two who probably have already started the process of making babies in the tree. And it is our resident pair of Warburg's eagles that live just below our camp and they're having a look at us. They're not very interested in us at the moment. And you can see their nest to the right. And I'm quite sure by now they've got eggs. And these two are really, really relaxed. They're nests right next to the junction of two roads and we drive past them so often they are very very relaxed around the vehicles they don't fly off now who can tell which is the male and which is the female I'm joking I can't tell either <laughs> I think the only way would be to actually see them caught in the act As with a lot of your Aquila or true eagles, it is not impossible to tell the difference between a male and female. Normally the female is a little bit bigger. And obviously she's a bit bigger because she needs to produce eggs, so she needs a lot more sort of storage uh, for fat and other things in her body to be able to produce those eggs. You can see that little crest that's a very indicative sign of a Warburg's eagle. So we've got two pairs that I know about on Juma. Uh, this one which is a pale, both pale morphs and there's one that's a pale morph and a dark morph. But they're settling in for the night so we're not going to disturb them any further. One bird I have heard calling, which I'm quite excited to show you, and uh, it's not that, which I know James has spoken about earlier on safari, but it's a very close relative. Brian and I actually had a quick, quick glimpse of them uh, today while we were off air, while we were tracking the Salala Pride, and it's the African cuckoo, and they fly around going cuckoo, cuckoo. Probably not the best impression of an African cuckoo ever, but. Uh, it does sort of sound like they're saying cuckoo. Now, the European and African cuckoo look very, very similar. And one of the ways to tell the difference is the fact that the African calls and the European is silent while in Africa. As I mentioned, open game drive comms, and Don is saying, is that what you guys have to listen to in your ear all the time? Well, we have to listen to them and the final control at the same time sometimes, but yes, it, it, it can be a bit frust uh, frustrating, and sometimes we do get that far look, where sort of uh, look on our face, and that's generally when the game drive comms can get quite confusing. Uh, when we're on Juma, they're generally a bit quieter, there's less vehicles that drive on Juma. But in Arethusa, there are quite a lot of vehicles, so those game drive comps can be very, very complicated. But we keep it in our air, so you guys don't have to suffer through it. Heading off towards the 
darkness. Chris is wondering, because we found a few comedians in the last couple of safaris, and hopefully we'll find some this evening, uh, whether comedians have, auto, uh, or have cognitive control over their coloration, or is it reactive to light? Because I think it's a bit of both. So, um, comedians do have some control, and I think some of their control, uh, some, of, some, some of it is not control. Uh, when a comedian is threatened or whatnot, it definitely um, makes a conscious de decision to, uh, to change control, and they, you even get that orange under the throat as a sort of warning sign. Uh, but when we shine the lights on them at night, they're very white and pale when we first see them, but then they change to, to green a bit later. So I think it's possibly a, a combination of both, but again, um, some more homework for me to check up on. One of my most favorite small creatures are going to start making a proper appearance, probably after a little bit more rain, and that's the different frog species we get here. And Pamela's wondering, do we have any tree frogs? Pamela, we've got quite a few different tree frogs. Uh, and she says, her brother lives in PR. I'm trying to work out where PR is. Pamela, let me know where PR is. Any ideas, Brian? Puerto Rico, maybe? Maybe Puerto Rico would have nice tree frogs. And they say they've got caco or keko tree frogs that go bo peep, bo peep. Ah, yeah, yeah, yes. Good guess, Puerto Rico. Um, so, uh, we do have quite a few. Our most common is called the gray tree frog, which is also the foam nest frog. And they do not have a very nice call. In fact, they just go burp, burp, little sort of grunt. Uh, and we do have quite a few other uh, types of tree frogs. A lot of the tree frogs, though, not so many in this area, but there are quite a lot of tree frogs in Africa. And here we've got frogs that are quite similar to tree frogs, which are, are reed frogs and, and leaf folding frogs, but also have the little sticky suckers on their feet, and they climb up aquatic vegetation. Christine has a very amu amusing comment because uh, she's wondering whether I hear the voices of the radio uh, in my sleep. Well, Christine, only the voices of final control. You're live, you're live, you're live. Sometimes repeated incessantly. Uh, but no, generally I'm quite good. I can switch that off when I go to bed. Uh, I do, however, sometimes hear lions roaring in my sleep and generally when I do, they actually have been roaring and it's my subconscious, I think, telling me I need to go find them in the morning. Same with leopard. There we go. Uh, nothing for the cake. Uh, negative Craig. Um, I couldn't see the tracks, they'd already been driven over by the time we went there. I walked the block between Buffalo's Hook and Quarry Pine, but I didn't get any luck. Sorry about that, I'm back with you after my brief chat with Craigie boy. So, we're getting to that time of the night where it's a spotlight is not quite useful yet, but it, it's still dark. We have to sort of check a little bit more carefully with the naked eye. And I've had some of my most fond leopard memories on this road. Uh, it was just literally right here in the drainage line uh, where I walked on foot the first leopard when I arrived, tracked and found the first leopard when I arrived on uh, arrived at Wild Earth and it was who turned out to become very quickly my favorite leopard it was Kunyuma, it was one of Karula's sons 
he is doing well into the west, or sorry, to the east and south of us, right ahead. And he actually killed um, a bushbuck down in this drainage line, and we found him on foot feeding on that. And he gave us quite a lot of wonderful sightings from there. And he also had that mad moment when he climbed up to the top of a dead leadwood tree, and then it started breaking. And uh, there's no possible reason why you would have climbed that tree apart from for fun and I think that's why I like that method so much he was slightly mad in the head like me and actually Ryan we can actually see the leadwood tree through the gap there that he climbed to look through it through a bush I think it's gonna be the best. Where, where do you think Brian a little bit further? Uh, which one? It's that dead tree it's right at the back. There. That tall dead tree there. There we go there's the top branches of that and he nearly made it up to that that height in that leadwood before they started the branches started getting a bit rickety and he sort of panicked a little bit and came down in a hurry. I do love the smells at the moment, definitely some wild jasmine flowering in the drainage line here and just this wonderful sweet smell. Can you smell that Brian? Oh, wonderful. different animals there and country girl Ash is wondering if we get any wolf species in the area. Uh, most definitely not Ash I'm afraid. Uh, no wolves this far down in Africa. Uh, very interesting though there was thought to be no true wolf species in Africa although um, the Ethiopian wolf or simian fox which lives up high in sort of right up in North Africa in Ethiopia uh, is descended is pos probably descended from grey wolves and there was a very strange species of golden jackal uh, found in Egypt which now with later with genetic uh, testing turns out to be a remnant population of grey wolf, grey wolf so the only wolves that live in Africa are in the far north there are no wolf species down this side we do have other canids though uh, canids are part of the dog family we have uh, jackal and we have two species of jackal in this part of the world. We have the black-backed jackal and the side-striped jackal. And then the other candidate that occurs here, and it's my favorite animal, uh, it is the African wild dog or painted wolf, Licon pictus, which basically is the Latin name, which translated means uh, wolf painted, if we go the right way around. And they are not related to wolves uh, as such, but we will get back to this because James has got some fornicating felines. Hello everybody, we are here with Shadow and Tingana who are, well, they're not doing much really. They're uh, just sleeping there in a um, probably post coital bliss, but apparently they haven't been mating much today at all. So perhaps, much like when we saw Karula and Tingana when she came into Estrus, perhaps they're just not into the full swing of things. And for those of you who've never watched leopard mating before or any kind of cat mating before, it is really astonishing. They will probably mate when things get really going. Uh, they will mate up to mm, probably 10 times an hour at the real height of the mating. But at the moment, these two beautiful cats are just sleeping quietly in a very thick area. Only space for two vehicles, that's why it took us a little bit longer to get in here than I'd hoped. Uh, but now we are here, we'll spend a bit of time with them and just enjoy what I think 
is Africa's most beautiful cat. That's the male there. That's Tigana, a nine-year-old male, and Shadow, a nine-year-old female. And she's up and about. Now, I don't mean that she's kind of uh, running around the place, but she won't sleep as soundly as him. If she's coming into Estrus, she will be highly charged, and you'll find that she'll be feeling probably uncomfortable. Now, the really interesting thing for me about this is that Shadow was in Estrus some time back, probably about two months ago, she had an extensive mating um, incident or affair with uh, this male, Tangana, and also the Anderson male from further west of here. And if she's now, oh, look at that big chap. If she's now in Estrus again, chances are, well, definitely, that she definitely didn't um, fall pregnant last time round from either of those two males. So if you are sending through questions, I'm afraid we're having some we are having some difficulty with the radios. So if you are sending through questions, uh, we will try and get them to you. We'll try and answer them as quickly as possible, but we are in a very thick area, and that does make communications a little difficult. of the amount of mating that poor old Tinganas had to do. Uh, I'm being sarcastic when I say poor Tingana. Um, it is amazing, and as Khad, as you say, he's had to be a very busy boy. He certainly has. I'm just going to wait for this other vehicle to move out, and then we'll probably try and get into the area where he was. I might actually have to get out of his way, otherwise I don't think he's going to get out of here. He's in an enormous car unlike this very nimble little thing that we have. It's a bit like Brentley Smith versus me, you know, nimble versus lumbering. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Are you playing with something? Oh, yes. yes. You're playing with a piece of plastic. Yes, sorry. It's very noisy. Sorry about that, Andrew. <laughs> Difficult to please. You've been very obstreperous today. This is the an interesting. Just sorry, before I comment on what has been commented on, I'm just going to move forward a bit and I'll get a slightly better view before the other vehicle comes in. was Janet, you were saying that, or asking, do I think he knows the difference between the two females? Yes, I definitely think he knows the difference between them. Um, they are mother and daughter, and so they're, <laughs> they're probably seeing quite similar to him, but I'm sure he knows the difference. Beautiful, isn't that wonderful? Incredible shot of the big male in front. Oh dear. Andrew? I've lost a picture completely, you think we're okay? Probably just the HCMI. There we go, we're back. Not sure if you lost um, any picture there, everybody. A couple of cable issues here that we're just sorting out. Engineer Andrew is on the money. And as I was saying, you can just see that she is far, far more aware and awake than he is. 
Okay, I'm just going to call in the other vehicle. Louis, do you copy? Make your way. I think Andrew's. Yeah, Andrew's pulled up. And perhaps if you're a new viewer and you're not familiar with the radios, we do we do need to stay in radio contact with the other guides around the place because they do obviously help us find sightings and likewise we help them. There we go. And even in this light, you can see the difference in the size. She is much smaller than him. Turn it off, I think, if you, you can't. I don't even know if we like. You've got view, huh? Yeah. Oh, here we go. Oh, no, I hope people are seeing this. Oh, here we go. You got a picture? Yeah. Everybody, I'm not sure if we like it. What an astonishing thing to see if we are live. This is just fantastic. Louis, um, yeah, just come, keep coming, come in straight behind me, you should get a view. I'll try and move forward when you're in. I'm going to have to turn the radio off. Um, it's interrupting our broadcast, so will you take over control, please? We are live. Apparently, we do have a picture. That is excellent news indeed. I don't think the radio is actually making a difference. I think it's something else. Now, Rex, wonderful. Just getting messages that we are live. But despite the fact that I can't see what's going on, you can see and hear what is going on. So, marvelous to see leopards mating. And I just want to give you an idea of how incredibly close they were to us. They're probably less than, mm, I'd say, <laughs> four feet from us. So that aggressive mating affair that we just saw was less than four feet from us. It's absolutely amazing to be able to experience cats like this when they are um, totally unaffected by our presence is just spectacular. And if you haven't seen mating leopards before, that is interesting. A little bit grim, but interesting. Now that, uh, of course, needs no introduction, but what you can maybe make out, maybe get a little, uh, that penis is barbed on the end, and that is what makes it such an aggressive affair at mating. Isn't that amazing? So close, we can't even see. Now she's got up to follow. Ooh, and he's now lying so f close to us that we can't actually get a picture. You want to come round? Yeah. So, I'm just 
pulling them around the other side of us. Now, somebody has just made a joke. I didn't get the name. Here she comes. She's just coming out of the darkness now. There she is. She's now going to try and induce him to mate with her again. This is amazing. They're basically almost in the car. Look at this. That's amazing. Isn't that the most blood curdling noise and somebody couldn't get the name, I'm afraid. Radio communications are not great. Uh, made a wonderful, well, not so wonderful for Tungana, and clearly incorrect statement that maybe he needs a little blue pool. He does not need anything of the sort. He's performing admirably this evening. He's walked off. He's lain down. I can't just see him. He's just in front of this other vehicle, so we won't be able to see him until we move. And she'll watch him continuously, she'll hound him, she'll make sure that she stays with him because it's her, as you can see, that creates, or doesn't create, it's her that is the seductress. It's completely unlike what it is with the human beings, but mainly it's normally us men that are then trying to the seduction. Here she comes again, she's coming down the hill, and an interesting question, I think it's from Beth, she is now of course mating with mother and daughter, or he is mating with mother and daughter, let's say they both have cubs, let's say one's male, one's female, would the cousins, well they'd be cousins I suppose, and second cousins, amazingly enough, first and second cousins in the same, in the same way. Uh, would they mate with each other? Would they know any about any sort of kinship recognition? I think they would mate with each other. I don't think it's unusual. And it certainly doesn't seem to harm them. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> Hello, this is just spectacular. All right. Everybody, I'm afraid we can't spend too much longer here um, because there are another two people trying to get in here. So we are going to probably leave you know, the next five minutes or so. I'm just going to find out where those other stations are. But we did have an incredible view so far. Station on standby for... Uh, no, hang on a second. I don't have radio comms now. Louis? Hi. Is the other chap coming in? Okay, cool. Alright, so we don't have radio working at the moment. Are you gonna try and follow them through here? Yeah, I'll I'll try to go around the side where Andrew came in. Back. Hold on tight, everyone. We might lose Andrew. It's okay. Come back and fetch him in the morning. You right there, Andrew? Yes. Ariel's still okay? Plus minus. Plus minus. Good. Okay. Let's get it on here. Ooh. Large turret. 
where it might land. Rather, they came, they came up here into this area. Tingana and Karula also mating and they had killed a buffalo together. And Arius Lynn, you want to know if these two will do the same thing. They may well. Um, I'm not sure. I have I've actually never seen it before. Uh, but it, I've definitely read about it before. Absolutely they may well try and hunt it together. I'm gonna have to turn the radio back on because I can't tell what's going on. So I'm hoping it's not going to destroy the broadcast. There they are. They've been there. I'm not sure. Is any station got visual of these two animals? There we go, copy that. Actually, the dam, there we go. I'm just going to find out if anybody else is trying to get into the sighting. Are there any stations on standby for the sighting? Great news everyone, we can stay. There's no one else coming to the sighting. So we'll just pop over the hill here. And there they are. Well, sort of. I'm not sure if we can pop over the hill without doing ourselves some serious damage. You see them there, Luke? there we go. We'll just let them walk quietly through there, and then we'll try and drive down there without causing too much noise. And do you think we can go straight over the top? I don't see why not. Okay, well, here we go. Oh, they're having a drink. Marvellous. We might be drinking with our Land Rover in next to them. Lovely adieu of catfish rotting. work on a hot day. They don't have to drink though, they get a lot of water from their prey. And just a quick recap for those of you who perhaps haven't been watching, I know Mo in Chicago, you've just joined us. This is Tingana and Shadow, two nine-year-olds and uh, Tingana, the interesting uh, sort of soap opera part of this uh, days of our lives, a bold and the beautiful type part of this sighting, is that he was mating with her mother not a week ago. And apparently there is a sore on the back of his back left leg. I haven't seen it. Can you see it, Andrew? Mm, he's not lying very nicely. Yeah. I to see. I on her leg, oh, seems to be a saw on the back of her left leg, I don't know, I didn't see it I'm afraid, I don't think it's anything serious, she's certainly not limping at all, so I wouldn't worry too much about it, let's stay with him for now, I'll tell you why, because if there is going to be any kind of, if there is going to be any kind of um, mating, it will be her that induces it, so if we stay with him, she will come back to him I suspect. She's just there, the other side of the dam. Um, and just to clarify, I think Sherry, you're a bit worried about, worried about incest here. Um, this is not a father and daughter. That's not to say father and daughter wouldn't mate as leopards. They definitely do it less than lions do. But it is possible that father and daughter could mate with each other. They say with these cats, or lions specifically, up to six generations of inbreeding can be tolerated before deformities start to be seen. Yeah. 
And so as I said earlier, <laughs> now we had a little bit of a debate about this the other morning when we saw Tingana with Karula and Sheila in Illinois. You have correctly pointed out that two months ago on the 21st they were seen mating Shadow and Tingana. Shadow is very clearly not pregnant. He's been seen mating with Karula as well. She hasn't fallen pregnant as yet. So he's, she's had two matings with him before without falling pregnant. And as we discussed on Saturday, maybe he has a problem. Is he perhaps, uh, to, not to put too fine a point on it, firing blanks? Um, well, I would say that was a possibility, Sheila, except that she has mated with Anderson as well. And we know that the Anderson male also didn't manage to conceive with her, so I suspect, I don't think it's an issue of, of that, I'm not sure why neither of them have conceived. Karula's getting a little bit old, that might have something to do with it. I think the fact that Sindile was still around when she mated with him last time perhaps would have, maybe she didn't ovulate, maybe she just came into kind of a forced or premature estrus and perhaps didn't ovulate because the, her less or just a year old cub Sindile was still around. I'm not sure, I really couldn't say, but it is an interesting one going forward to watch if Tingana is perhaps not um, firing on all cylinders. I don't... And then far more traditionally, of course, now, to, f to find her mating at this time is not unusual. It is with all the cats. As soon as they lose cubs, they do come into estrus. Sometimes it's a false estrus, sometimes it's a real one. And Mauritia, you're absolutely correct. The loss of Sandile recently pot could well have brought her back into estrus. Although, remember that she was mating. She did go through a full mating cycle with two male leopards before Sandile left. So, now it's difficult to say. Fascinating stuff. It really is so interesting. And for those who perhaps new viewers, um, just to give you a quick recap of Sindile. Sindile was Shadow's, or is Shadow's son. He's a year old. Um, he unfortunately caught a rabid dog um, not too long ago. And so he was taken away to a rehabilitation center where they were just going to check that he didn't show any signs of rabies. So far, so good. And they now are looking for a tracking collar and it has to be a self-detaching collar because he's still growing so much because they'll want to track his movements so they're going to put a collar on him so that they can follow him uh, but it's apparently these collars that um, you know, the, what they call self self detaching so he, you know it'll fall off on his own on its own as he gets bigger apparently they're very rare difficult to get hold of and that's one of the reasons that we aren't seeing him now we had a comment about a possible injury on the back end of Shadow, well, he's limping. Now for a leopard, if that's a serious injury, that's a real problem. But he's in pretty good nick. It doesn't look like he's been injured for long. And look at the size difference. It really is astonishing. great for him, I have to say. That's worrying. He's far more interested in the game drives than he is in the, his duties as a male leopard. Mm. They prefer the seclusion of behind the land over there. A little bit back. Now there are lots and lots of questions about why, and I don't mean this from the viewers or necessarily, I mean from just generally about why on earth cats need to breed so often. And one of the reasons is that it helps to induce ovulation and it helps to um, it sort of it 
induces ovulation and helps to guarantee a pregnancy. And Ashley, you want to know if the amount of times that they mate makes a difference to how many cubs they produce. Ashley, it doesn't make any difference at all. One cub, two cubs, it doesn't make any difference. And that is just a simple fact of biology. And that's a simple fact of the biology is that every time a male mammal and I think it's just about the same for every male mammal ejaculates, there are millions and millions of sperm in that ejaculant. And what that means is that, you know, if there is an egg there to be fertilized, it will be fertilized. The, how many cubs they have is purely to do with the number of eggs there are in the uterus or about to come down into the uterus from the fallopian tube. I'm just going to let some of the other guys have another look. We are all fervently hoping that one of these leopards will have cubs soon. I haven't seen leopard cubs here. I've seen them in other places, but not here. But wouldn't it just be the best, as Donna suggests, for us to have two litters of new cubs? So I'm afraid it's a little bit thick in here, so we may have to wait our turn before we get another proper look. But they are moving along the road, and I don't know if you saw there, he is definitely marking his territory, I think. the road here of course and they're moving down the road not doing much and we're in the way of various vehicles let's go across to Brent um, if we get into a decent position we'll come back and we'll look at them let's head across to Brent he is with some much larger animals coming out of the water I'm so jealous of you guys and James right now you guys must be having the most fantastic time over there so what Brian and I have done is we've been sitting really quietly here and hoping to show you guys something we don't see too often. And I'm just going to put the light on them quickly. And we, the hippos have been slowly, slowly moving closer and closer to the edge of the water. And we're hoping we will catch them leaving the Bufflesock waterhole before the end of drive heading out to go graze and they have been moving ever so slowly closer to the edge that they should be going out sometime quite shortly so hopefully we may be able to catch them before they do and also this is the last area where the tracks of Karula were seen so also a good place to sit quietly and listen and even maybe she might surprise us with a, a cameo appearance for a drink at the water hole Crossing back to the east. Thank you. I'll see you in the morning. And that's Craig on his way home. <laughs> Good evening. I'm back to the east. Any updates? I think Craig's got confused between his radio channels. Uh, Craig, you're still on the northern channel. Can I speak to Thora, Craig? Yes, of course you can. Thora, Thora for Andrew. To speak. Don't don't ask her to come in. No, she's talking to Ben. Clara, if you can go back through the clips and record this stuff, that'll be great. I don't have memory card. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Sorry about the uh, bits, of, bits of confusion. The, every time I start the car, the radio cuts off. We're we are live. If we can't get hold of these little again. We did see them mating yet again. So poor old Tingana, who was accused of needing a blue pill, uh, clearly is doing his job. Well, I can't see them in there. Oh, 
that they've done on the road. Are you guys pulling up? Thanks very much. Thanks, man. Right. They're all ours. Wonderful. There we go. Mating again? No, they're not. I don't know where she is. She will be around here somewhere. No, that's... who's that? That's Mr. This is, is around here somewhere. We'll just gently move behind him. I'm not sure where his missus has gone. So he's walking actually a bit easier. So he looked like he was he was injured. He's probably just a bit stiff from lying around all day. It's probably a slight injury. He and um, Karula, Shadow's mother, did kill a buffalo uh, a little while back, a few days ago. A young buffalo, but that was a big animal for him to have killed, and perhaps he got a bit damaged during the hunt. Okay, we're going to quickly go across to Brent. I'm going to keep with the leopard. See you just now. So, there go the hippos. We're just going to show them quickly and say our quick goodnight. Sorry we weren't able to be out there for the most of the safari, but it seems like we've fixed our technical issue, uh, for now at least. And so from Brian and myself, and the large bottoms departing the Buffalo Hook waterhole, uh, hopefully we'll see you a lot more of you on the sunrise safari and have a wonderful evening and enjoy those leopards with james right you're back with us tingana is marking territory he's walking along a territorial boundary here he's marking territory i don't know where she's gone but like i said it will be best to stick with him because she of course is the inductor or inducer of this mating episode he won't go chasing her she will chase him so we'll follow him and see what happens i i mean i can't imagine that she isn't around here somewhere she may have got sick and tired of it and moved on it's not likely to happen though he is definitely limping can you see that now the crucial thing for leopard okay it's, it's dangerous for them to get injured they are not like lions so they live totally on their own and if they do get injured of course there's no one to help them feed and so he will need to get over that very quickly carry on slowly. Um, I think that this injury was probably caused during that hunt, either during that hunt with um, Karula the other day, where they took down a buffalo together, or it's possibly during all this mating. Now what you notice is that when they come across, or when, they, when, he, when he dismounts, what happens is she flicks over and she starts to, you know, she'll hit him and perhaps her claws got in, into him and that may be what's wrong with his foot and um, I don't think as I'm afraid I missed the name because we were starting the car I think it was Abby maybe I don't Eddie Abby I don't think that it was caused by a territorial uh, fight if leopards have a territorial fight and it's not usual it's unusual normally they'll just sit next to each other and growl uh, but like two men facing off in a bar, neither of them wanting to really test one against the other. And that's what leopards generally do. And if he had had a proper territorial fight, he'd be sore on the, on the head. He'd definitely have taken some hits and bites on the top of his head. So I think this has been caused by mating or the killing of that buffalo the other day. I just hope it heals. Now apparently this is not the first. Oops, go on, see. There she is. Look, look at that. 
just gone out in front of him. She's looking for him, and he's hiding from her. <laughs> Too late, chum. <laughs> She's got mm. you. <laughs> he's, so, he's so irritated that he's been spotted. <laughs> this is just, just unbelievable. He's had a gut full of this. And he's trying to mark his territory and all she wants to do is his mind is not on the job at all. Side light, Andrew. Are you okay with that? Just put the side light. Okay. Is that it? That's good. Okay. Just sneak in a little bit forward. Now, the good, very, very good news about what they're doing now is they're heading straight towards Juma. That means we should be able to have them to ourselves tomorrow with any luck. He is playing hard to get, he is disinterested. He's marking his territory, he's a man on a mission, and he's being distracted and it's starting to irritate him. You could see as she came up, he put his ears back, turned his head as if to say, oh really, now, again? Surely not. <laughs> All right, so everybody, we are going to, let's just watch what happens here. It's nearly time for us to go. Let's just watch what happens here if they actually do get it on as it were but he is just not interested this is marvelous to watch we'll just watch the end of this little sequence of seduction <laughs> there we go yeah well done brave fellow well done Tim Garner now you can see how that might well have hurt his foot. Don't hurt his foot, Shadow. Wonderful. So, Carla, as you say, every man's hero is... Well, certainly some men's heroes, like the script from The Bold and the Beautiful circa 1989 or so. I think that's when I last watched it. So, as they walk off into the darkness. Uh, it's time for us to say goodbye, a very quick goodbye. We've run a little bit over time, which of course is no problem for us at all, and I'm sure if you're on the internet there enjoying this, it's probably no problem at all as well. A uh, big thank you to Andrew. Thank you, Andrew, for all your technical work today on the Viewers, tell us where you're from next time round. It's